Okay, so what we previously looked at in earlier chapters was different types of distri distributions and the shapes of them. Okay, we have uniform distributions, skewed left, skewed right, and normal. Okay, now we're going to focus on normal distributions, but just to refresh your memory, remember what a uniform distribution is, is that all the data values appear the same amount of times. So, with, so the data is uniform throughout. Okay, so just a quick example of what that looks like. If you were to graph a uniform distribution, okay, let's just say that random variable x represents the, uh, the number of classes missed by students uh, in a semester. Okay, and let's just say um, a frequency of, let's say, 2. Every value would, would occur with the same amount of frequency in order to be uniform. Okay, so that's what, the, that's what a uniform distribution would look like. So basically saying there are two students who missed one class, there are two students who missed two classes, two students who missed three, and so on. Two students who missed four. Okay, so uniform just means that the distribution it has the same frequency for each of the possible outcomes. A skewed left or right, well, when you look at a frequency distribution on that, okay, let's just look at one. Okay, maybe look something like this. Okay, well this would be skewed to the right because if you were to trace the general pattern here, you can see that it's longer off to the right hand side. Okay, no matter what these values represent here, okay, that's what a skewed right would be. Okay, so there's some outliers out here to the right. Okay, so that's pulled to the right. Skewed left is just the opposite. Um, and that should say skewed left, not skewed left. Okay, and then we have the important distribution of the normal distribution. Okay, and what a normal distribution was, was if you had a frequency distribution that starts out rather low and then kind of builds itself up to a highest value and then decreases basically symmetric around the center of the distribution. So then when you trace that, you end up with a nice symmetric bell-shaped curve. Okay, and that was a normal distribution. Okay, and that's what we're going to look at more now because there are properties that are true of all normal distributions. Okay, normal distributions occur a lot in the real world. Okay, whether they're the ages of, uh, of a certain population or whether they're heights of men, uh, heights of adult women, weights of men, weights of women, um, ages of things. Okay, many things follow normal distributions in the real world. Okay, so there's six properties here. Okay, the first property of a normal distribution that's bell-shaped, symmetric around the mean, Okay, so on our curve, the mean, okay, mu, okay, the population mean is right in the center. And also, the second thing, mean, median, mode are all equal. Okay, basically saying the mean, median, mode are all in the center of the curve. Okay, so the middle number will be in the center of the curve. And the mode, the number that occurs most often, again, if you look at this as, just a, as frequency bars, Okay, then this is the highest bar right in the center, so that's where the mode will be also. The third thing, this is not an obvious thing, but this is a mathematical uh, concept. The total area under the curve is 1. And the basic way you want to think about that right now is that 100% of the data lies under the curve. So when you look at all those uh, bars for the frequency, 100% okay, of the data is represented within those bars. Okay, so 100% of the data lies under the curve. The total area under the curve is 1. So if you think about 100% without the percent symbol, then that's 1. Like 50% is 0.5, 70% is 0.7, and so on. Okay, so 100% of the data represents 1. Now in, term, in terms of probability, what we're going to get into is that if you have all of the data, you have 100% of it, 
So the, so the total area is going to correspond to probability. So when you look at 100% of the data, the probability of a certain event, meaning you have any possible outcome, is 1. Okay, or 100%. Okay, the fourth thing, the curve approaches but never touches the x-axis. Okay, a, a word you might have heard of before is an asymptote or asymptotic behavior. Um, that's when the curve gets closer and closer to the x-axis but never touches it. Okay, basically saying it can, in, the in theory, the curve can go on forever in each direction. Okay, number five, you would have looked uh, way back in chapter two, I believe it was, that the empirical rule applies. That's the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. Um, and we'll get into that uh, at the bottom of the page here. And then the sixth thing is the distribution represents a continuous random variable. Okay, you may remember from the last chapter, a discrete random variable meant there was a discrete or countable number of outcomes. Now we're looking at a continuous random variable. So things like ages, weight, uh, weights, heights, time, those are continuous random variables. Okay, so a normal curve for random variable x. Okay, we have x labeled on the axis. Okay, so that's a random variable. Okay, and we're basically saying the mean is in the center of the curve, and then you can count one, two, and three sigma, or standard deviations, above the mean and below the mean. Okay, so again, the mean is right in the center, and then uh, in, uh, what we generally do is we can count one standard deviation above the mean, two standard deviations above the mean, three standard deviations above the mean, and then also below the mean. Okay, so an example of that, on the next page, suppose the wait time on Friday nights at a busy restaurant is normally distributed with a mean of 30 and standard deviation of 6. Draw the distribution and label the axes. Okay, so the fact that they tell us that the wait times are normally distributed means we're going to draw this curve, a normal distribution. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect, okay, it's just so we can get a visual representation of it. Okay, I'm going to label that x because the wait time will be our random variable x. And then right in the center will be the mean. And we know from the problem that the mean is 30. And then if the standard deviation is 6, okay, we're going to go 1, 2, 3. 3 above the mean, so we're going to take 30 plus 6, okay, and I'll label that as the mean there, will be 36. Add another 6 to that, so 2 standard deviations above the mean will be 42, and 3 above the mean will be 48, and then we can go 3 below the mean. So subtract 6 from 30, we get 24, subtract 6 again, we get 18, and then 12. Okay, so that is what the distribution of wait times would look like. Okay, now, we previously uh, looked at z-scores. Recall that a z-score is the number of standard deviations that a data value lies from the mean. We have the following formulas to find a z-score. Okay, so z, if you have a sample, z is x minus x bar divided by s. Okay, z is the number of standard deviations from the mean. X is your data value, X bar is the sample mean, and S is the sample standard deviation. For a population, it's the same concept, except instead of a sample mean X bar, we have the population mean mu, and then instead of the sample standard deviation S, we have the population standard deviation sigma. But the concept is the same. To find the number of standard deviations from the mean, you take your data value, subtract the mean, and divide by the standard deviation. Okay, and later on we'll talk about why we're going to round to the nearest hundredth. Okay, it has to do with charts that we use, but um, that's not something to focus too much on right now. Now the major use of using a z-score is they assist us in finding probabilities associated with normally distributed continuous random variable x. Where x may represent weights of men, ages of cars, heights of women, in the case we have up here, 
we have wait times at a restaurant. Okay, and the significance is, is that if you look at a man who's 70 inches tall, if they have the same z-score as a car that is six years old, then they lie at the same location within their distribution with respect to their mean. Okay, so what that means is, when you look at the generic normal curve from the first page here, you might have a mean of 70, of uh, what's that say, 68 inches for, for uh, the height of men. They might be 68 inches tall. And the average age of cars may be four years. Now, each, th those are definitely different values. So you have a, a, a mean of 68 compared to four. But the standard deviation is most likely going to be different for each distribution. So the heights of men may have a, may have a standard deviation of three inches. Okay, the, the years of car, or the average years of cars, may have a standard deviation of 0.5, okay, or 1, or, or 0.7, okay, whatever it may be. The idea is that a value of 70 inches for the height of a man, let's just say that's one standard deviation above the mean, if a car that is six years old has the same z-score, meaning one standard deviation above the mean, then, they, then they're going to lie in the same spot on that distribution. The significance of that, if they're in the same spot on that normal curve, you're gonna, the probabilities associated with those values will be the same. Now, if you don't understand that right now, that's okay. We'll get into that. Okay, but again, what a normal curve allows us to do, it allows us to take any normally distributed random variable and plot them on the same curve, basically. So we may be looking at heights of men, wait times, ages of cars, of heights of women, weights of women, the time it takes to run 40 yards. Okay, if we know we have a normal distribution, then we could la label them all with the same look. Okay, and we can go put the mean in the center and then label the standard deviations away from the mean on the, on the uh, axes. Okay, so... This gets us back to the empirical rule, which you've seen before. Okay, but now we're going to get into it in more detail. The 68, 95, 99.7 rule. Okay, well, you can see on the diagram here, in a normal distribution, 68% of the data values lie within one standard deviation of the mean. So between negative 1 and 1, standard deviation from the mean is 68% of the data. Now, what's very important here, notice that now we have a z-axis instead of an x-axis. Okay, so again, the, the significance of that, of that, it's extremely important to understand this. The, the heights of men may have a mean of 68 inches. The ages of cars may have a mean of four years. The wait time of this restaurant had a mean of 30, or 30 minutes. Okay, the significance is they're all in the same location, right in the center of that normal curve. So 68% of the data lies within one standard deviation of the mean. So between a z-score of negative 1 and positive 1 is 68% of the data. Within two standard deviations, so between negative 2 and positive 2 for the z-scores is 95% of the data. And then 99.7% of the data is within three standard deviations of the mean. So between negative 3 and positive 3, there's 99.7% of the data. Now, we can keep on going. We could go to negative uh, 4 below, uh, and 4 standard deviations below the mean, 5 below, 6 below, 7 below. But what you notice is when you, when you keep going farther than 3 away from the mean, 3 standard deviations from the mean, you only have 0.3% of the data remaining. Because it has to add up to 100% total. Okay, so in theory, you can keep on going on forever to get to that 100%. Okay, so you could have a z-score of 50, it's just going to be way out to the right, a z-score of 50. That means you'd be 50 standard deviations above the mean. All right, so a quick example of using that empirical rule, or the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. Okay, looking at that same distribution, so we have the mean of 30, standard deviation of 6, find the probability that a randomly selected person waits between 24 and 36 minutes. While 24 and 36 minutes 
is one standard deviation below and above the mean. Okay, so I'm going to write some stuff out mathematically here just to reinforce. If a, if a six minutes, what we're looking at is the probability that x is between 24 and 36. So mathematically, this is what the question is asking you. Find the probability of 24 less than x less than 36, which is saying that x, the wait time, is between 24 and 36 minutes. Okay, so remember, this x value, that represents an actual wait time. Okay. All right, now we know, without even doing any calculations, that 24 is one standard deviation below the mean. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to that question on the last page and I'm going to make just one more axis, label it our z-axis. The mean of 30 is zero standard deviations from the mean, so that z-score would be zero. 36 minutes is one above the mean. 42 minutes is two standard deviations above the mean, and so on. So we could label our axes as a z now instead of just looking at x. Okay, so we can change, we can convert the probability of 24 being less than x being less than 36 minutes. We can say that's equal to the probability that negative 1 is less than z is less than positive 1. Okay, so basically 24 converts to negative 1 as a z-score. Okay, so what we did, we converted x into z. Now, just to show you the formula, we said that z is x minus mu over sigma. So that would be our x value, in this case is 24, minus the mean of 30 divided by 6. So that would be negative 6 divided by 6, which is negative 1. So that's, that's, that's mathematically how you can get that number. Now we know, by looking at the, at the uh, axes here, that z should be negative 1. But really, using the formula, this is where that negative 1 can come from. For the 36 minutes, we can say that z, again, is x minus mu over sigma, except now x is 36 minutes minus the mean of 30 divided by 6 will give you positive 6 over 6, which is a z value of positive 1. Okay, so that's another way to get that positive 1. Okay, now, by the empirical rule, we know that 68% of the data lies within one standard deviation of the mean. Okay, now I'm going to just show that real quick here. Okay, remember from the last page there, between negative 1 and positive 1, we had 68% of the data. Okay, so we know that's going to equal 68%, or we could write that as a decimal as 0 0.6800. Okay, either answer is okay. Okay, part B, find the probability that a randomly selected person waits less than 30 minutes. So less than 30 minutes... In math, that same question is the probability that x is less than 30. That's going to equal the probability we're going to turn x into z is less than, well, 30 minutes on the x-axis is the same location that 0 would be on the z-axis. Okay, so the probability that z is less than 0. Well, now when we look at this, that 30 minutes or a z-score of 0 was right in the center of the curve. Because of the symmetry, you have 50% to the left of 30 and 50% to the right of 30. So the probability that x is less than 30 or that z is less than 0 is 50% or 0 0.5000 as a decimal. Okay, and if you wanted to use the z formula for that, the idea there would be z equals your x value we're looking at is 30. 
minus the mean, which is 30, divided by 6, and that'll give you 0 over 6, which is 0. Okay, so that's another place to get that 0, or another way. All right, part C, find the probability that a randomly selected person waits more than 42 minutes. Okay, so this one is a little bit trickier. More than 42 minutes is the probability that X is greater than 42. Okay, so if we locate 42, it looks like we are two standard deviations above the mean. Now, as far as the curve goes, okay, and let me just draw, uh, draw kind of the area that we're looking at here. Okay, we can see that 42 minutes is a z-score of 2. So z equals 0 is in the center. There's 1, 2. Okay, so that's a z-score of 2. And we want to be greater than that. Okay, so that looks like it's going to be a fairly small piece of the graph. Now we can tell it, it should be, the probability should be less than 0.5 because to the right of 0, okay, from 0 and to the right is 0.5 altogether. So we have much less than that shaded in. Okay, so we should get a fairly small answer for our probability. Okay, so we just said the probability that x is greater than 42 equals the probability that z is greater than 2. Okay, so one way to look at that is we have 50% of the data from here over. Okay, that's 50% total. If we knew the area from 0 to 2, we could subtract that from 50 and then have our answer. So for example, if we know that the area from 0 to 2 was 40% probability, then what's, what's shaded to the right of 2 would be 50 minus 40 or 10. If we knew from 0 to 2 was 30%, then we'd do 50 minus 30 to get what's left over here, 20%. Okay, so now we're going to use our normal curve. Okay, and I'll put that up here again. That we know if we're looking at greater than 2, that has to do with two standard deviations above the mean. So what we can do is we, we can take the 95% that goes from negative 2 to positive 2 for the z-scores. We can take that 95 and divide it by 2 to get the area from 0 to 2. So 95 divided by 2 is 47.5%. So what we could do, we could take 50% subtract 47.5% and that'll be our answer of 2.5%. As a decimal, without the percent we can say 0 0.0250. A little bit trickier. Okay, so again what we just found was from here to here is 47.5 percent. Okay, so when you take the 50 percent minus 47.5, we get our answer. Okay, uh, part D, probability that a randomly selected person waits less than 24 minutes. So that's the probability that X is less than 24. So we'll convert that to a z-score again. Well, again, looking at our normal curve, 24 corresponds to a z-score of negative 1. So that's the same thing that the probability of z being less than negative 1. Okay, so similar to the last one, if we look at the curve, okay, we, again, we know that 0 is right in the middle. A z-score of negative 1 would be right about there less than 24 minutes or less than 1 for the z, no, I'm sorry, negative 1 for the z-score, that means we're going to shade that area. That's the area that we're looking for. So again, we know from, we know from 0 all the way to the left, we know that's 50%. So we can use the area from 0 to negative 1, or from negative 1 to 0, however you want to think about it, Subtract that from 50 to get our answer. 
Well, we know within one standard deviation of the mean, look at our rule again, within one standard deviation between negative one and positive one, there was 68%. So divide that by two to get the area from negative one to zero. So that'll be 34%. So we know from here to the middle is 34%. So we're gonna take 50% minus 34% and that'll give us 16%. Okay, or as a decimal, 0 0.1600. Okay, so that is using the normal curve and the empirical rule, or the 6895-99.7 rule, to find probabilities. Okay, the last thing that is going to lead into the next, into the next uh, lesson, suppose we're asked to find the probability a person waits less than 33 minutes. Does the empirical rule apply? So that would be the probability that X is less than 33. Well, if we look at that on our normal distribution, 33 is halfway between 30 and 36. So we can, we can tell that the z-score is going to be 0.5. So that'd be the probability that z is less than 0.5. Now unfortunately, when we look at our empirical rule, We're only looking at integer values away from the mean, standard deviations from the mean, integer values. So 33, we can tell the z-score is going to be 0.5. So if you did 33 minus 30, that's 3. Divided by 6 will be 3 over 6, which is 0.5. So you might naturally think that, well, gee, if we take half of 34, then that should work. But you got to be a little bit careful. When we say 34% of the data is between 0 and 1, notice that when you look at the height here, okay, when you look at that area between 0 and 1, so if we were to look from here to here, 0.5 is right in the center there. If you were to look at the area of those two pieces, the piece here, Okay, this piece right here is taller than the piece over here. Okay, it's taller than this piece. So that means the area between 0 and 0.5 is going to be larger than the area from 0.5 to 1. So we can't just take 34 divided by 2. The reason we could divide by 2 before was because we were symmetric around the mean. We're not symmetric around a z-score of 0.5. Okay, we're symmetric around the mean. So between negative 1 and 0 is 34%. And from 0 to 1 is 34% because you can divide that 68 by 2. But you can't go to the left or right of the mean and then just assume that the areas are going to be the same if you divide in, in half. Okay, so does the empirical rule apply in this case? Okay, no, the empirical rule does not apply. So the next stuff we get into, we'll look at, well, how would you actually find that probability? Okay, so that'll be the next lesson.